Christy Purifoy is a writer and gardener who loves to grow flowers and community. She lives with her husband and children at Maplehurst, a Victorian red brick farmhouse in Southern Chester County, Pennsylvania. And we're excited that Christy is welcoming Jenkins participants to Maplehurst for a writing workshop on May 14th. Christy earned a PhD in English literature from the University of Chicago before trading the classroom for a picket fenced garden and an old writing desk. Today, she grows zucchini. Her four kids refuse to eat, but her zucchini loving chickens are perfectly happy with this arrangement. She is the co-host of the Out of the Ordinary podcast and the author of three books, Roots in Sky, Placemaker, and Garden Maker. So at this point, I will turn things over to Christy to get us started. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, thank you everyone who is joining us uh, and good evening. It's so good to be here with you. I am coming to you from my home here in Chester County, Pennsylvania uh, called Maplehurst. Um, but I do think before I dive into this topic of placemaking, I think it is important for me to acknowledge that I, I don't come to you first as an expert or an authority, um, but rather as someone who has received a placemaking legacy from someone else. I really am here tonight um, speaking with you because in 1880, uh, a couple named Mark and Priscilla Hughes, two Pennsylvania Quakers, built a red brick farmhouse and a bank barn for themselves and their two daughters um, and a herd of Guernsey cattle, uh, one of the first such herds actually to be imported into, into the US from the Isle of Guernsey. Um, and as well, before I um, show you, uh, I have some images to accompany my talk as well tonight. So before I show you that house, we are also here because another couple left a placemaking legacy uh, that became Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens. Uh, if you got to see some of the slideshow that was running before I began speaking, you saw their wedding photo. Um, Lawrence and Elizabeth Jenkins, uh, they were not enormously wealthy or famous. Um, they were in many ways a wonderfully ordinary uh, family, but their house sat on a beautiful parcel of land and they loved this land and love like that wants to spill out and wants to be shared. And so we're gathered here uh, because it does not require great wealth or prestige to make an enduring place as they did. Um, and really at the risk of sounding a bit uh, sentimental, <laughs> placemaking only asks that we love and uh, we all have love to give. And the love between Lawrence and Elizabeth uh, the love they poured out on their place eventually welcomed other placemakers into that vision in order to grow and shape that initial legacy so that today Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens continues to inspire and educate and really hand on to another generation the love of cultivated places. And I'll begin with that word cultivated. And as well, I'm going to share my screen now and uh, pull up some photos for you. There we go. They're coming. The photos are coming. <laughs> but first, I'm going to begin with that word cultivated, um, because this idea really is at the core of what it means to live uh, as a placemaker who is capable of leaving a lasting legacy like the Jenkins or like the Hughes who I mentioned and um, really like anyone who leaves the world a more beautiful and more healthy and more whole um, and fruitful place leaves the world more whole and healthy than when they found it when they first began their work. Um, but I acknowledge here at the beginning that that may sound um, on the one hand, like an excellent and fairly straightforward thing to do, leave a place better than we found it. Um, but actually it is not 
so simple. And if you feel at all cynical about this idea of cultivation, then actually you're not alone. I have felt it too. Um, in an age when we are sadly over familiar with the devastating, if often unintended consequences of our interference in the natural world, um, habitat loss, uh, invasive plants and pests, fertilizer runoff, microplastics, these are the things in the news. Well, our cynicism is well-founded. In the name of cultivation, we humans have done a great deal of harm. And I acknowledge that here at the beginning. And even in my own small gardening and, and tree planting efforts at Maplehurst, I have done harm. I have interfered in natural processes that I didn't fully understand. Um, I've introduced uh, potentially invasive plants and maybe even pests through carelessness sometimes or just a lack of knowledge. And I certainly see everywhere around me some of the harm done unintentionally by previous generations. Um, there are some enormous Norway maples uh, around my home that someone planted long ago and they're beautiful, but no doubt they have sent out countless seeds to invade um, our uh, natural woodlands. And I here do battle with Japanese beetles, spotted lantern flies, and also I struggle against the prickles of the, that mile a minute weed, which you know if you live in this area, um, which apparently I've read a few different versions of the story, but apparently may have been introduced even a hundred years ago into Pennsylvania through contaminated holly seed. So these, these things happen. And this idea of cultivation of human intervention and shaping of a place, place making. I think it's okay to ask, is that another old fashioned concept that we should just discard or retire? Um, should we maybe instead just commit ourselves to rewilding our landscapes and our places and trying to return them, like maybe just leave them to the weeds or, or maybe try to return them to um, something more pure or pristine that doesn't have our fingerprints all over it. But for the purposes of this talk, I won't draw too fine a line. Uh, and here's Maplehurst. I won't draw too fine a line between um, the forms of cultivation, whether we're trying to reintroduce native flora and fauna, as I love to do here at Maplehurst, or whether maybe some of us are practicing formal garden arts like topiary, um, perhaps organizing a community garden at our neighborhood school. All of these are forms of cultivation. And the thing that matters is that we practice them, I think, with humility, uh, which means I think that we are careful, yet also we are courageous. We do get out there, we do try, we do dig in. Um, we must commit ourselves, I think, to a continual learning through programs like these offered at Jenkins. And we must, I think, even the introverts among us, um, of which I am one, we must seek out communities where our own knowledge and our efforts can be augmented by the knowledge and the efforts of others. Um, but more about that to come. First, I just really want to tell you um, a little bit more about the placemaking legacy that I received 10 years ago when I first came here to Maplehurst. And uh, you can see a, a photo of the house as it was when, when we came here 10 years ago. Um, so I wasn't really introduced to the concept of placemaking through a book uh, through a class, um, rather I encountered it, I came face to face with it really in this house. Um, 10 years ago, I moved with my family up to Pennsylvania. Um, that summer, my husband and I had we'd flown up from our home in Northern Florida and we had to find a house. We had two days to do it. Uh, we could not fail because I was eight months pregnant and um, with our youngest. And so we told our realtor we wanted an old house. Uh, we knew that old houses have lots of bedrooms and we did hope that extended family might come to live with us one day uh, as well. We hoped for a little bit of acreage because I was longing to start a garden and, and to grow more than I had in the past. And we were thrilled to find this house called Maplehurst. Um, we were thrilled when the generous sellers uh, agreed to rush the whole process so we could move in three weeks later. Um, and we were especially grateful to find an old house on which so much restoration work had already been done. Um, but the day we moved in, 
one of the young men employed um, by the moving company, uh, he, he paused, you know, carrying the boxes in and he looked up at the house and looked at us and kind of had this smile on his face. And, and he said, wow, I just love that you two bought a fixer upper. And uh, I was shocked, actually, even a little bit offended. Um, fixer upper, I, I did not see at that time what he saw. Um, and it's a good thing. <laughs> or I might never have been brave enough, or as I mentioned, courageous enough, or even crazy enough to take this on. Because um, the truth that we would discover in time is that while the work had been begun and begun well, there really were years and years of restoration projects in store for us. And despite our pedigree as um, pretty experienced DIYers and we've lived in old houses before, we would not be able to, to do the work alone. Um, some of the craftspeople we found to work with us, they've been perfecting their skills for, for decades. And restoring Maplehurst um, has been for me really a, a crash course in placemaking as a community venture and as a relational activity. Um, placemaking creates places that that have the potential to become legacies, and, and that word will keep coming up tonight, because placemaking creates places that seem to have a unique and an almost living spirit. Um, so we're talking about places with unique personalities and maybe with a unique purpose or mission. This means that the, the Jenkins Arboretum that we know today, it's not a place frozen in time. It's a place that has grown and evolved and a place that bears fruit for future generations. So in that sense, it's alive. Um, it is a living legacy of the love and intention and vision of Lawrence and Elizabeth Jenkins. But to begin with the opposite of placemaking, which is sometimes helpful to think about, well, what if we're trying to get at what is placemaking, maybe we begin with the opposite. We can make places that seem more dead than alive. Um, we do it all the time. We are very familiar, I think, with places that look like this or this. They may be necessary, but you know, they don't seem like living places to us. But I'll leave us with a more pleasant image <laughs> of a secret garden in New York City. So the art of placemaking, uh, and it has elements of both art and science. It gives us places imbued with our own creativity, our own care, and, and yes, love. So the potential for a built place to have an almost living spirit really began to be revealed to me on the very first night um, that I spent here at Maplehurst. Um, we moved in the 1st of August, it was very hot. Um, we uh, were st starting to unpack, but we put the kids to sleep on mattresses and um, I was hot and tired that night and trying to get up to my room. Didn't have any lamps yet, didn't know where the light switches were, um, hadn't plugged things in. Um, but as I came to the stairs to go up to my room, I realized that the stairwell was flooded in light. Um, I, I took one step and then I just sat down there to appreciate it because I realized on the stairs that, um, that there was a large uh, Victorian kind of two over two window in that stairwell and um, it perfectly framed an enormous, brilliant full moon. And uh, here's the window in a, in a sunnier moment, but it was framing the light of this moon. Um, and so the window became like a frame for the moon and even the staircase was, was doing that and was like a vessel for moonlight. And I knew then that this was not just a house, whatever we mean when we say something is not just, <laughs> right? Um, but that this house had been shaped and placed and planned with care. Some person, perhaps Mark or Priscilla Hughes, had checked their compass and watched for the rising of the moon and the setting of the sun um, and marked out the boundaries for this house and determined where the windows would go. Um, and now I, 130 years later, had received the work of their hands. Um, and I really credit the grace of that moment for giving us the courage and faith to, to persist and to move forward with, um, you know, what would often be difficult and frustrating and expensive, you know, home repairs. Um, but we knew that the place was worth it. There's Mark Hughes who built Maplehurst. 
You know, the reason that we're gathered here for this lecture really is that so many visionary placemakers um, have made this area around Philadelphia so well. And there are the names that are familiar to us, like um, William Penn or Pierre Dupont at Longwood. Um, of course, we're indebted to the Jenkins, but there have been so many other more anonymous placemakers. Uh, we learn from them. We walk in their footsteps, we inhabit the places uh, that they made, even if we don't always know their names. So this man, Mark Hughes, along with his wife, Priscilla, built a beautiful house, but the qualities that make it beautiful, they're really hard to put your finger on. I mean, the bricks are nice, but there are other houses with very similar bricks. Um, the shape is simple, but you know, pleasing to me. That's Victorian, but not ornate. Um, I love the little curve on top of the windows, but these are not really the things that impact how it feels to be inside this house. Instead, the house feels good and, and I call it beautiful because of the way moonlight puddles on the stairs or because of the way the, the bay windows are, are positioned to, to capture the light of the setting sun. Um, it, the house is beautiful because it, it holds light. It's a vessel for light. Uh, and there was one particular summer, uh, not really so long after we'd moved in, um, uh, when we had projects going on that uh, required some different teams to, to be helping and working with us. And um, I, I, rem I don't remember the projects were, but I remember vividly uh, two conversations with two men um, who took time to stand out in the yard with me uh, like this under some of the trees. And um, both of them said to me, this place reminds me of home. It reminds me of home. Um, well, one of these men had been born in Vietnam. Um, the other, who was with a different team, had been born in Mexico. And I was thinking Vietnam, Mexico, Pennsylvania. These places um, are so different and so far apart. And yet, as we stood outside, uh, you know, leaning against the fence and watching the chickens pecking, um, they both said, this place reminds me of home. And truthfully, on summer days when the chickens are out and um, you know I'm, I'm watching them, I am also reminded of home. Uh, my father always kept chickens in our Texas backyard. And while neither man exactly mentioned the chickens, you know, perhaps that was it for each of us, that there was something about the green quiet of a house and a fence and some trees and some chickens. And we all felt this sense of home. And it's important, I think, to think about what gives us a sense of home, of peace, of belonging, a sense of safety, of abundance, of cultivation. We, we might use different words. Um, we might point to different elements. Uh, our vision of a good place or a home-like place may or may not have chickens in it. <laughs> Mine does, clearly. Um, but when three people from such different places can all stand in one place and say together, yes, this feels like home, um, then I think we, we have a lot of reason to hope that, um, I won't even say despite our differences, I'll say uh, uh, really because, because I think some good, helpful, creative energy can come uh, even uh, through our differences. Um, I feel hopeful that we can make places that we all can love, and that will become um, a legacy for those who follow us. And I think I learned something important about placemaking uh, from my conversations with those two men. Uh, and it's this, we can follow our own personal unique passion or our own personal artistic vision. We can follow our own creativity. We can make and build and grow the things we want to see and love and, and, and care, and, and that care we pour out onto a place, it can become a gift to others. And it might be easy to assume that if we're making a place as a legacy for others or a place to share with others, um, if we intend to pass it on, that uh, we might need to make it in some way or form that is, uh, has mass appeal or is you know generic or vanilla, to use that term. Um, but in my experience, the very opposite is true. In this way, placemaking is actually um, a lot like my work as a writer. 
um, and especially as a writer of memoir and a personal essay. Um, because the interesting irony of this kind of writing is that the more concretely personal and uniquely particular that we make our writing, the more persuasive and powerful it is, the more people it speaks to, um, and the more people connect with it. it. It's just the irony. And so without following this tangent too far, um, I imagine that you can recall stories or memoirs that impacted you, and, and I bet they were the opposite of generic. Uh, likely they were highly specific and personal. Um, and another small example of this is, um, I've always had a thing for homes where the resident goes overboard uh, with what we might call um, tacky yard art. <laughs> and uh, I know this may not be to your taste. Um, it isn't exactly the look I've gone for at Maplehurst. And yet, can you imagine driving by this house and not smiling? Um, I mean, would you think for one second that this home was abandoned or unloved? and that the people who live here don't care. I, no, I mean, I think we would all agree without even knocking on the door um, that whoever lives here loves life and loves their home and probably has a good sense of humor. So when I talk about placemaking and especially if I use a phrase like the art of placemaking, remember that I am always talking about love and beauty, but beauty is different from prettiness. Uh, beauty isn't just an image, it invites us in. Uh, beauty has room for all of our humanity and that includes our sense of humor. So we know that laughter is good medicine and uh, places can heal and places can help us return to wholeness. Um, there's something else I see, I think in my memory of that summer and my conversations with those two men, because we were talking about home and, and yet we shared a sense of distance from home, even if you will, an experience of displacement lay behind our conversations. And um, so I'd like to say just a bit about the potential of our placemaking to heal what ails us uh, individually and collectively if we take care with it and attend to the heart behind our placemaking efforts. Because even if you were born in the place that you still call home, which is not my story, um, nor was it the story of those two men, um, but even if you have always stayed and never moved, I'm sure your place has changed around you. Uh, and that is rarely an easy or um, enjoy entirely enjoyable experience. So maybe you haven't moved a mile, but home no longer feels like home. What can placemaking offer you? Is it, is making places simply more change, more development, which is almost always a dirty word in some of our conversations, as if development must always equal loss and never gain. Um, but really placemaking has actually restored my faith in the ability of humans to create good in the world. In particular here at Maplehurst, um, I've learned how restoring an, an old house is about healing, uh, which for us has meant that it isn't always a matter of historic preservation, but of careful storytelling, if you will, um, because places can tell stories uh, and we can help them do that. Uh, and this was all explained to me by John Lintner um, of Building Preservation Services here in Chester County, who told us that we had a decision to make um, about the restoration of our windows. Uh, when we moved into Mablehurst, all the windows had um, this sort of rope pulley systems, uh, but all the ropes were frayed and broken, um, which meant that, you know, if you could get a window open, you'd have to prop it up with a stick or with books. And so John told us that he could replace the ropes and eventually years down the road, they too would fray and again need to be replaced. Or he said we could replace the ropes um, with brass chains, which would essentially last forever. And I said, you know, why would we do that? Isn't it our job to just restore what's already here? Um, but he explained that if, if the house had been cared for all along, um, this change would inevitably have been made. Um, in time, one fallible material, the ropes, would have been replaced with a more uh, durable one. So were we, with the repairs, that the decisions we were making, were we trying to return the house to the past? Or did we want to care for the house in ways that carried it more strongly uh, into the future? 
And so we, we chose the chains. And uh, that's because sometimes healing a place looks like restoration. Sometimes it looks like innovation. And gardening, it turns out, is uh, really similar to the restoration of an old home. It is an art both of maintenance keeping plants going year after year, um, but also embracing change and embracing growth. Now, the story of my flower garden, which I've really focused uh, my placemaking efforts on of late, it began because two of our um, old Norway maples, they died and they had to be taken down and we were left with stumps and this kind of empty spot with just weeds. And I used to sit on the porch and just um, stare out at that and wonder, I began to wonder, could I grow flowers there? And I do want to emphasize that placemakers are those who look at empty places or broken places or ugly or sick places and acknowledge that all is not well. Um, and placemaking is a form of art, of creativity. And like all art, it is actually the material form that, that our hope can take. Um, so the trees were gone, we had only weeds, but I hoped for more and I hoped for better. Um, and so I planned a garden, though I had no experience <laughs> designing gardens um, or even growing flowers, uh, actually, just the zucchini, that's all I had experience with. Um, but it's not easy to persist in hope in our world. Um, there's more bad news every day and it can feel overwhelming. And what are our own small efforts compared with the devastations of um, climate chaos or war? And so I, did, I worried for months um, about whether or not I should commit the time and the energy and yes, even the money to make a flower garden. Um, I've grown vegetables for years, but that's easier to justify. I thought, you know, beauty can seem frivolous. Um, it can seem self-indulgent. Why risk anything just for beauty? And there's the garden more recently. I think it's beautiful. Not always, but the right time of the year. Actually, no, it's always beautiful to me. <laughs> But it was, it was with a great deal of doubt and worry that I began to make this garden. Um, and if you've read my memoir, Placemaker, then you know the story of how the garden slowly grew so that it became over the course of two years, a little more recognizably garden-like, um, a little less like a great big mud pit. Um, but in the winter before the garden's third spring, we learned that um, my brother-in-law had lost his life in a military training accident. And, um, and my younger sister was now widowed uh, with four young children. And that June, my sister and her kids uh, came to spend a whole month with us at Maplehurst. And every single day, we were out in the flower garden uh, picking flowers, taking pictures of flowers. Um, my, my young niece would help me feed weeds to the chickens. Um, and we would just sit on, the gar on those benches and just soak it all in until the chaos and the grief of the past months and, and all the still unanswered questions about the future stopped screaming quite so loudly. And together in the garden, uh, we found a place where peace was possible again. Um, and in this way, the garden that I had agonized to make, um, the garden I had worried was extravagant and foolishly self-indulgent, became the place that held us and cared for us and made it possible eventually to move forward. So friends, never ever question the value of cultivated places and beautiful places. They are worth more than we know. Um, and as a small side note, I really encourage you to check out this recent book by Sue Stewart Smith called The Well-Gardened Mind, The Restorative Power of Nature. Uh, if you wanna learn more about the really the deep healing that is possible only in a garden. But of course, placemaking is not a one and done. Um, it is a way of life. And even my beloved flower garden had, has had to be not only made, but remade and renewed. So my initial plan for the flower garden was sketched out on graph paper. Um, and it made, I thought, a very pretty picture, <laughs> uh, very symmetrical, very traditional, but overflowing with uh, plant life. 
and the garden we made um, followed the plan and made a very pretty picture. And despite my inexperience as a designer, I, I didn't completely neglect the needs of human bodies in the space, but I reserved room and two beds for, uh, for benches, and, um, but they were very quickly overwhelmed by the plants. So then even that made a pretty picture. Even the bench I could not sit on <laughs> made a pretty picture. Um, but placemaking, real good placemaking, it's not skin deep. It's not a superficial thing. It is not just a pretty picture. It's much deeper than that. And really I've learned I can't just content myself with a pretty picture. Um, so for instance, every time I, I walked friends into my garden and to show my flowers, and especially once we could no longer sit in the benches, um, we would walk in and around that circular path and then it would just sort of spit us right back out again. Uh, so a few years in, I set out to alter that plan. Uh, my husband and I, we, we dug out that central circular bed of flowers. Um, and then in, a, in essence, we kind of took an eraser to some of that beauty. We made the picture less pretty, not more, um, by building new gravel paths and filling in the center of the garden with just gravel and bringing in a chair and a glass top table. Um, but then we could see that we had made uh, really an even better place, a, a more beautiful place, because now this garden had uh, space for us. It had become not just a pretty picture, but a place in which we could be, not a place to look at and admire, not a place just to pass through, but a place that um, welcomed us and uh, embraced us in a way that feels to me a lot like the way that the farmhouse Mark Hughes built um, is a house that embraces and holds and, and makes space for people and for light. The farmhouse called Maplehurst, it, it isn't just a pretty picture, a pretty place, um, a thing to look at and admire, um, but because it holds light and has space for light and people, because it frames the sun and the moon, um, because there's kind of a beauty in the larger design as well as the small details, it feels to me like a place that is alive, um, the way a garden is a place that is alive. And there is this sense of life uh, in large part because space has been left for life to happen and sunlight to come in. And ultimately that is what placemakers do. Whether we're cultivating a flower garden, uh, whether we're helping children learn to grow radishes or organizing a litter cleaning volunteer day, we are creating places where life can happen and where human beings can flourish. So we set up the table where hard but necessary conversations can happen. Um, we plant the tree where someone can find rest in the shade. In our culture, we are adept at creating functional places for passing through, for waiting, for consuming. Um, we make waiting rooms, parking lots, airports, shopping malls, food courts. But as humans, we need places, and this is Beatrix Potter's garden, we need places where we can be uh, in the fullness of our humanity, not just as consumers, or patients, or travelers, but all of ourselves. These are the places that we have to cultivate for the sake of our health and our neighbor's health and the well-being of our communities and eventually of the entire planet. Because cultivated gardens are human scaled places. They're like me size, they're people sized. Um, and when it comes to our built environment, uh, that, you know, where we spend most of our time, uh, things are rarely made on a human scale. Um, I mean, we live in a world that is scaled for the speed of automobiles or the height of city skylines or, you know, even soaring atriums. Um, even many suburban homes nowadays, uh, you know, have those double height uh, entryways that are, you know, too tall to repaint without, you know, some professionals and some good ladders. But a garden is different. Uh, not only are garden plants set about on an entirely human scale with paths and, and seeding that's just right for us, but gardens invite us to go even smaller. Uh, we kneel to weed, we, we crouch to harvest, and we find ever more to, to see and explore. I mean, in what other place do I notice something as small as 
a ladybug or as delicate as you know a dandelion's fluff um, really only only in my garden and a place scale for us as humans um, it's a place we are able to take care of um, and and that is able then to take care of us um, we've created a world in which uh, you know it regular people have very little that we can take care of or repair. You know, once upon a time, we could repair our small appliances or tinker with our cars. But, you know, now if I drop my iPhone, that's the end. <laughs> I mean, I can't do anything with it. I can't fix it. I can't tinker with it. I can't care for it. Um, but gardens, they need us. We are the only ones uh, who can care for them and make them and, and we can all do it. Of course, we don't always get it right, especially not at first. Um, as placemakers, we are uh, sometimes making places from scratch. We are sometimes fixing broken places. We are sometimes restoring places to what they once were. Uh, we are sometimes revising and renewing a place. And all of this is placemaking. And all of us, all of this gives us places in which we can flourish. Um, because we don't live our lives in nothingness or a vacuum. We live our lives in places. And, and these places are so much more than a backdrop. Wendell Berry, if, if you aren't already acquainted with his work, is a Kentucky farmer and a poet and uh, well known for novels and essays and, um, and his love for the environment. Um, and he, he is himself by any definition an artist, and yet he extends this definition to, to each of us. I'm an artist, you are an artist, he says. Um, and he says on the one hand that the arts, um, they're essential to our lives, um, but he also defines the arts very broadly. When I speak of arts, he says, I would prefer to mean simply the ways of making things. We have been using the term in the sense of fine arts, uh, but when a culture is doing well, all its artifacts are made well and afford the kind of solace that only beautiful work can give. If our ability to make things has degenerated to the point where uh, we must go to museums to see art, then we no longer have art. Our museum is a mausoleum, he says. And museums are wonderful and we need them, but are these the only places where we encounter art and, um, and beauty? Then, then that means that art in our community is, is dead. It's no longer alive. So when I talk about the art of placemaking, I'm talking about art um, not as an object we go to see, um, but as something we live with, engage with, um, even participate in. Uh, if art is central to our humanity and it's been kind of squished into um, smaller and smaller portions of our lives, then those who are involved in the work of placemaking, um, they really have a unique opportunity to restore being essential to our daily lives. And if that title um, artist feels too heavy for you, how about creative? Uh, the longer I live, the more convinced I am that we are all creative. Uh, in different ways, different mediums, but it is just baked into our human DNA. Uh, we are creative. And if you love a place, and if you care for a place, or if you see a place in need of love and in need of care, then tapping into your creativity um, to do something, to do anything, uh, is powerful. I read a magazine article uh, recently about a British woman. Um, uh, she's, she's become known for her, I guess, garden activism, you could say. Uh, which really is just simple gardening, but she does it in places where we aren't accustomed to seeing uh, garden beauty, like uh, she'll plant flowers in the little pit around a street tree, like in a city environment. Um, her name is uh, Karen Liebrick, and her motto is small defiant acts of beauty, which I just love. Um, urban environment, she says, uh, are often harsh and ugly. But if you can create a little patch of bee-friendly plants where rubbish used to collect, then you've achieved something. It's as simple as that. Um, now, Karen went on this article to talk about, you know, how hard it can be at times. Um, and yet I mentioned her to remind us that placemaking isn't only on the grand scale of a DuPont leaving his mansion home, you know, to become a public garden or, or even the more modest gesture of, you know, the, the Jenkins um, whose initial acres were supplemented by a neighbor who, who caught the vision. Um, but placemaking can be powerful and transformative 
even on the scale of a single street tree, a window box, a raised bed, a community garden, a grower's market, um, a seed swap amongst neighbors, or even perhaps transforming um, a typical fertilized lawn into a pollinator paradise. Um, there's some new seed mixes for bee lawns and, and uh, really the sky is the limit when it comes to placemaking that makes a difference. Well, I think placemaking is where solitary gardening and gardening often is, meets community effort and even sometimes community activism. So when it comes to placemaking, there really is room for everyone. Um, I still remember uh, the epiphany uh, I had in my own garden one day when I realized that working alone in my garden was actually a generous and um, a hospitable act because by creating a garden, by making a place, I was preparing a gift that, that others um, could receive even on their own. Um, and so even receiving the placemaking gifts of others is a part of, of the equation. So, um, you know, my hospitality and, and welcome is like baked into the garden I'm making for other people. Um, and so we can do it in community, in relationship, we can do it on our own, but it is still for the community. Well, here at the end, before we move into some time of Q and A, um, uh, just show you some of the pots I had on my front steps last summer. Um, because you may be asking now, you know, how, um, where do I begin? Like, how do I find a place that's um, that's mine to make? And I, I'll just say that you know, if you're waiting for a Maplehurst, um, if you're waiting for your own farmhouse or acres, then I would really encourage you to, to stop waiting and, and just dig in and get to work um, because every place is worthy of love and wherever you are, that place is worthy of your love um, and can be transformed by your love. Um, every place can care for us if we care for it. And um, I lived on the South side of Chicago for 10 years and poured out my love into a window box and then a tiny balcony. Um, and uh, that place gave back. I, and all I grew were, you know, some boxes of petunias and geraniums, um, but what a life-giving place. And, um, and, and so here at Maplehurst, even though I do have acres that I love to garden in, that can also be overwhelming, <laughs> some of my favorite gardening, my favorite placemaking has been in just arranging some plants on the front steps and, and just um, showering some attention and care on that spot so that it, it um, is there for whoever stops in, even if it's just you know the, the person dropping off a package, it's a little moment of beauty just for them, something that says, um, welcome. But if you're wondering here, is this place making that can become a legacy? How can it last? Because you know, petunias die after one summer. Half the plants here in this image, you know, they're not perennial. They didn't make it through the next year. It just seems so ephemeral. Does it seem too ephemeral to matter? Um, I think this is the wild thing about making places. Sometimes our, our work is material and tangible and lasting, like switching out the ropes for the, for the chains in our window sashes, um, or taking the legal steps to preserve your land or hand it down as a public garden. But sometimes placemaking is simply creating a special mood for a party and sharing that with your friends. Um, the mood doesn't last, the party doesn't go on forever, and yet you have made something that endures. You have made a place and cultivated a moment in which people can connect, and that is the stuff of life. Um, that is work that, that heals, that's transformative. And uh, maybe you're restoring a house, maybe you're planning a new garden, but maybe honestly, you're just setting the table for dinner and you're putting some flowers in a vase. In all these ways, we are placemakers and it does matter. And I would love now um, to, uh, to hear from you and uh, to respond and um, take any of your questions. And I know you'll help us with that, Amy. And I will do that. Christy, thank you so much. That was so wonderful. And your images are so lovely to look at as well. All right, let's see. So if anyone has any questions for Christy, feel free again to type um, down in the Q&A section of your Zoom toolbar. And 
we'll see what is already in here. Great. So um, I'm assuming this question was when you first started and you were explaining what Maplehurst was, you mentioned that it was a bank barn and someone asked um, if you could explain a little bit more about what a bank barn is. Yes, especially whether you're, you're from this area or not, bank barns I think are a really unique um, Pennsylvania, especially Philly area feature of old farmhouses. Um, and this is something else about placemaking is uh, really celebrate like, like learning to read the story of our own place and culture and celebrating that. And, and so a bank barn uh, essentially was a, was a two-story barn that had a grassy bank that would let a wagon of hay go up to the second level hay loft and unload its load there. But um, the, you know, the sort of first floor entrance of the barn was over here. And so here at Maplehurst, the farm has actually been sold off for development. So we're surrounded by neighbors. We kind of sit in an ordinary, you know, suburban neighborhood. Um, and even the barn itself fell down or we've heard maybe burned down many years ago. But what is left is that bank. <laughs> and so um, just today I was out there sitting at the top of the bank and I planted daffodils all up that bank. So the barn is gone, the farm is gone, but the bank is there and it's really beautiful with those daffodils and now it's our spot to, to sit. But around here um, I often see bank barns as I'm driving around and yeah they're just a, a real relic of that time in particular I think to, to this area. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Um... So the, the structure that is out in your garden, I'm um, sure. sorry if I missed this part, Did, is that something that you guys uh, built and created or is that something left by previous yes, owners? So we did put it in. I, I'm glad someone asked about that. There is, um, I'm gonna actually, as I'm sharing, I'm gonna look it up so I can tell you exactly her name because she is local. Um, a, a woman who uh, was hunting for kind of kind of old world looking wooden garden sheds and couldn't find them and connected with Amish craftsmen in our area to build structures like that. And um, I found her a while ago when I was first dreaming of that flower garden and um, uh, and so uh, was able to visit this um, Amish craftsman's uh, workshop and see the shed and then it was brought to Maplehurst and then I really designed the garden around it. Her um, her, the company is Hillbrook Collections, Hillbrook Collections, and they're local and they're using local craftspeople. And, um, you know, that isn't always an option for us, but man, if it is, uh, it just feels so good to, to like literally shop local, even in our, <laughs> our garden yeah. design. So uh, I was really happy to bring that little garden shed um, to Maplehurst. It's such a focal point. It's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, and someone asked with the, the finial at the top of your garden mm -hmm. shed, was that something that also came from that, that company you mentioned? Yes, and here's, you know, here's a little something I'll share. I, I remember when, um, you know, it was a stretch for us to, to purchase that real wooden structure. And, um, but we felt like the garden, I don't know, we just, at that point we were committing and we were dreaming of beauty. And but like I said, I still have these doubts and, you know, often they're, they're financial. And, and with that finial, I remember asking, it was an extra fee to have the craftsman make that wooden finial for the top, mm -hmm. excuse me, for the top. And uh, I remember debating like, gosh, it would be so beautiful but is it worth it? And, you know, we ended up going for it. And I, again, that isn't always an option, but here, what, eight years later, um, I've repainted it. I'm so grateful for it. I no longer remember actually what we spent on it to have it done. Um, and so sometimes just going for the beauty <laughs> is worth it. Um, and then to know that others are, are finding joy from it as well. And it's all a part of, you know, it doesn't always have to cost money, but you know, those little ways where we can imbue some kind of unique personality into a place um, is really fun to do. And I think the finial being so oversized and, and kind of unique does that. But I remember not yeah. just doubting, should I do it? <laughs> well, we're all glad you did. It's, it's so <laughs> lovely. Um, someone is asking, why did you choose to focus on flowers and stop uh -huh. growing vegetables? Yeah, um, although actually now I'm um, building, I'm expanding a bigger vegetable garden. So I, part of it is like, um, you know, seasons of life moving in, you, you, you just move into new things. So I'm actually excited to, to be growing more, more vegetables, but flowers, I think will always actually be really kind of where my heart is. And again, that was something, and I think our culture, I felt like 
certain kinds of gardening maybe have a utility and a practicality. And I thought a flower garden, like, is that just an indulgence? Um, but I think I'm just wired to crave beauty and to long for it and to just really be nourished by it. I think we all are, um, but, but maybe just some of us to an even greater extent. And so the kind of return I have received from being able to live surrounded by flowers and their beauty is, I think it feeds me in ways that zucchini never has. <laughs> as great as zucchini can be, like the, the flowers actually feed really my soul um, in ways that I need it. And so again, not for everyone. Um, at the same time, if you are growing vegetables, and this is how I started, it's a slippery slope, but, but you know, you want to attract pollinators. And so having some good single open faced flowers like Cosmos and, you know, some of the simpler flowers and some more of our natives, like that's going to bring in good insects and you want that um, even for your vegetables. So everyone needs flowers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, someone was hoping that you might be able to repeat the, um, the resource that you gave for the, the book, mm -hmm. and I'm forgetting what the title is as well, and I'll write that down and include it um, when I, I send out. Recommend. Yes. So oh, it there is we go. The well garden, so I have it right here because I'm still, still referring to it. The Well Garden Mind, Sue Stewart-Smith, um, fairly recent, um, I think still just maybe in hardback, uh, I'm not positive, but um, so well worth it uh, to just the research she's done into the therapeutic benefits of gardening, especially for those who've experienced trauma. Um, she writes about uh, incarcerated individuals, soldiers who've gone through war, um, but it, it, her own garden, um, and just really the science behind um, what gardens do for us. Like I knew it, but reading it just, you know, it may, it just brings it home even more. And I think this book is in, inspiring more people to go into gardening as a kind of therapeutic um, venture for those who are healers, those who want to be uh, doing healing work. Gardening and healing, they, they go hand in hand. And so, yeah, her book is a great resource for more about that. Great. Thanks for, thanks for mm -hmm. sharing that with our audience. I, I appreciate that. Um, someone now has a question. Um, they were intrigued by your example that you gave about um, the restoration work you did with the windows at Maplehurst. And do you have any other examples like changing the chains and the windows? Do you have mm -hmm. any other um, restoration examples at Maplehurst where you're thinking into the future, um, not just living in the past? Right, right. We do. We've made quite a few changes. Um, you know, a significant change was rerouting the entire driveway because in the past, um, the driveway was sited for, for wagons going to the barn or for carriages dropping off at the front door. And, uh, and so it actually circled the whole house in order to access the barn. And so it was a huge change when we finally decided to rip that out and, and just have it kind of circle in front of the house. It, it gave the house more of a backyard and a place where my kids could play before we'd have like UPS trucks just barreling through like right where the kids were playing and but I admit it it is it's a mixed thing because it has fundamentally changed the kind of site that the house is sitting on now you know when you look at the front of the house you know you see that drive in front you see areas to park and um and so I I even now that picture I first showed in the beginning I look at it and I think oh that was beautiful but what we have now works and meets our needs and meets the needs of guests who come and need a place to park and need to find the front door. And so it isn't, I think again and again, I find that my love of beauty and trying to cultivate beauty, it can't always be the only consideration or even that there's another kind of beauty, a beauty that is not maybe so pretty, but has a wholeness and works in a way and invites people in. And, and I would say the driveways is one of those. It is less pretty um, it was pretty before just to have the lawn going up to the house. It looked very rustic and natural. And yet um, this is more welcoming and, and functional and safe. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes that, that is the, the better choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone just popped in and said, can you talk a little bit about your hardware door restoration? wonder, do they know? Is it somebody they I know? know. <laughs> they might know. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, our doors. Um, oh gosh, our, yes, I, I, I wish I'd even included a picture in the slideshow. If anyone wants to find me on Instagram, sometimes I share things like this on there. But uh, we recently, after years of, of uh, me staring at these doors that were, I could no longer paint because they had so many layers. They just were dropping paint. And um, finally, a, a dear friend who'd done lots of restoration work on the house that agreed to do the really onerous task of stripping them and repairing them and stripping all the hardware, things that I had done all the, all the research, like, could I do it? Could I DIY it? And I just knew, I don't think I could do it. Um, and he did it for me. Uh, and then when he first brought back the hardware, he, he like boiled it in a crock pot and he brought it back. And I saw for the first time that all the little keyholes on the door were white porcelain and all the hinges were engraved like filigree metal. And we had never seen that before because they had mm -hmm. all been painted over. And I don't know who that first person was who first took a paintbrush to that to the hinges and the in the keyholes. You know, what? I don't know. Maybe I, I won't judge. I know <laughs> things happen. Um, but to to see them suddenly revealed uh, that beauty that had just been hiding under the paint. Um, you know, there those moments over ten years, or you know, can feel a little few and far between. But when they happen, uh, and I love and doing it with him too. In a way, it was so much better than DIY because his name was Bill. He was so excited to show me. <laughs> and in fact, I wasn't home when he first brought them. And so he let, I remember he left them on my kitchen table with a big note where he'd like point, drawn an arrow to them and said, look at this. And like a big smiley face because he was so excited for me to see what he'd uncovered under all that paint. And so, yeah, when I talk about being able to share, you know, place making with others, that 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 is part of it where you're you're um you're sharing in the work but you're sharing in the joy as well and so now I, i'm glad that i didn't even try to do it on my own but um, i got to have that experience with bill and invite him into it and uh, also he saved me a lot of work <laughs> right <laughs> but yeah yeah realizing the beauty we had in the stores all these years you know we lived with them for years this was a recent project um mm -hmm. it's really fun and astonishing it's me yeah. So what would you say, what are your upcoming projects? What, what do you think your upcoming projects are for the one for the house, one for the garden and one for your writing? Ah, oh, great, great question. Okay. So the garden one's easy because it's spring and I'm out there doing it. Um, we uh, are planting a new shade garden under a big old magnolia tree that we have. And um, I'm really excited. I, I think it, maybe it's a sign of my growth as a gardener that, you know, years ago, I really, gardening was just what you did in the sunshine. <laughs> and I really just knew bright, colorful things that grow in the sun. And um, uh, the more I get into it, the more um, exciting I find shade gardens, especially because I recognize, and this again gets back to placemaking and, and making places where people want to be and where life can happen. You know, in the summer here in Pennsylvania, as in many places, it's very hot and humid and, you know, um, we're not in July going to be so comfortable sitting out next to our sunny border. But a shade garden is where we want to be. You know, we want to be in that cool place. And, you know, as our climate's heating up, like we want shade even more. We need it even more. And so I'm really excited to, to learn more about, you know, shade, especially some of our native, you know, woodland plants and, um, and, and grow and develop this, this shady area around the magnolia, knowing that I'm going to need it in the summer and my, you know, family's going to need it and friends who come, like we're going to, I just know, gravitate to that area um, where we can have a, a shady retreat. And, and at the center of the garden is this magnolia that is just huge and old and may have been planted almost a hundred years ago. And so I often, I, I can't be around that tree without thinking, someone planted this and I am so grateful. And so also I am always planting trees thinking about someday mm -hmm. someone's gonna need that. Um, work on the house continues, although really we've started to see the light at the end of the tunnel 10 years in. <laughs> So that's good. Um, although still, as we walk around the floors, oh, my poor kids and me will we'll sometimes get splinters in our feet because of the old floors. So refinishing the floors, I, I hope will will happen sooner rather than later. And um, there's some good like oils that you can use just to do it really naturally. So excited to do more of that. And um, and then the writing has really been 
astonishing to me. You know, I started as a more academic literature person and then began writing memoir and never expected that I would be writing about gardens or gardening, never dreamed of that. Mm -hmm. And yet um, in my most recent book, it was all about my flower garden and included my photographs. And I'm really excited that I have two more gardening books coming. Um, the next one, uh, I don't even remember when it comes out, it'll be a little while, but it's called A Home, a Home in Bloom. And it's really about all the ways we can live a life rooted in the garden, indoors and out, like year round, we can be, our homes can be rooted in a garden and, um, and which is really how I try to live here at Maplehurst. Um, and so I, I'm as surprised as anyone that this is what I'm doing. And yet, I think it's natural too, because the garden has been um, so life-giving to me. Um, and so it makes sense that, you know, my writing life has kind of taken this, this not detour, but this turn um, uh, to share with others, you know, the, more about the things that have, have just, you know, been such gifts in my own life. So, uh, so more gardening books are coming and I'm really happy about that, really excited. That's wonderful. That is absolutely wonderful. Um, does anyone else have any questions out there for Christy? All right. Well, while you guys are thinking, if you have any last minute questions, I just thought I would share a couple things. Um, you may have seen if you saw the opening slides um, promoting some of our upcoming events and programs. So we are so excited that we're going to actually be um, having a program in person at um, Christie's farmhouse and, and garden, Maplehurst on May 14th. So if anyone would like to join us for that writing workshop, we do still have spaces. Um, I will include that registration link with the email that I send out about the recording. So um, hopefully some of you will sign up and join us. That is going to be a really, a really special event at, at Christie's um, beautiful Maplehurst. I can't wait to, to come and help host. I also wanted to share those of you out there who are now inspired to um, continue to grow your gardens or start a garden. Um, we do have two different plant sale opportunities coming up at Jenkins. So tomorrow, um, Earth Day, April 22nd, um, is the opening of our outdoor nursery of the garden shop for Jenkins. So from starting tomorrow through about mid-October, um, we'll be selling everything from perennials to shrubs to trees um, and everything kind of in between. Um, and a lot of those are native plants. So if you want to come, we would love your support. Um, we grow really beautiful, healthy, wonderful native plants to, to put in your landscape. Um, and then at the end of April, so the 30th and May 1st, um, we are partnering with the Valley Forge chapter of the American Rhododendron Society for a plant sale weekend, which will have some really unique and special uh, rhododendrons and azaleas, as well as other plants for purchase. Um, so again, that is the last weekend, first little bit of May. So April 30th and May 1st, we'll be partnering with um, VFARS to have that awesome plant sale. I, those of you who are supporters of Jenkins knows that that sale has been on hiatus for a couple of years. So we're excited to bring that back um, this year. And Friday night, April 29th is actually an exclusive um, shopping evening where it's like kind of a little bit of party and a little bit of shopping. Um, so you can buy tickets for that um, on our website as well. So again, you know, we love being a part of the community um, and Jenkins would love to be the place that gives you those wonderful plants for your, for your home and for um, extending your placemaking as well. So um, let's see if anyone popped in with anything while I was talking. I think we are are good for tonight. But Christy, I would just want to thank you again um, for taking the time to, to speak to our audience tonight. This was a wonderful presentation, especially the, the eve of Earth Day to kind of reflect and um, think about all the concepts that you brought to us tonight. Oh, thank you so much. It's a real honor and a pleasure. So thank you. And we look forward to all that's to come. And um, most, I guess, most upcoming is our wonderful writing workshop on May 14th. So I will see you then. <laughs> Wait. All right. Thanks, Christy. Bye, everybody. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.